Okay, guys, welcome back to Thinking Caps. This week, I'm joined, as always, with Richard Jones, our CMO, Cheetah Digital. And we were lucky enough to wrangle from the safety of his own home here in May 2020 during the COVID, Michael Stutz. Michael is the Chief Customer Officer at Bloomin' Brands. They've been a Cheetah client for quite a few years, and there's some really exciting things that I can't wait to talk about today. They're doing great things in the uh, restaurant vertical, but we'll let Michael talk about that. And uh, there's going to be some great strategy and some great tips you're going to take away from this one. So Richard, I'll let you take the first crack at having our guest Michael Stutz here. What do you got for him today? Great. Well, welcome, Michael. Um, let me let me kick straight off. We'll get into the to the to the heart of the matter. I mean, if you're if you're trying to imagine uh, verticals that are most impacted by COVID nineteen. It has to be said that you with Blooming Blooming Brands are right at the heart of this in the restaurant uh, space. So, you know, you guys made the news, um, which was quite surprising, I guess, to a lot of folks uh, a, a few weeks ago, because um, you hadn't actually made any layoffs of full time staff. So I want to dig into that and kind of figure out how you guys are actually surviving what how are you being nimble what are the sorts of things that you're doing but before you jump into that could you give everybody a little bit of a view of blooming brands and the brands and then let's kick in to see uh, how how you've managed to get away with not laying off any full-time staff yeah sure thank you and uh first of all thanks for having me on and second thank you for allowing me to wear a hat uh i wear a hat pretty much every day now i haven't tucked a shirt in in probably two months so uh you caught me in my normal habitat um uh, so first, just Blooming Brands. Uh, we are based in Tampa, Florida. We're in the casual dining industry. Uh, our brands that you may know are Outback Steakhouse, Carabas Italian Grill, Bonefish Grill, and Fleming's Prime Steakhouse, plus our new fast casual concept called Aussie Grill. Uh, we got about a thousand locations nationwide, plus a handful of international locations in Brazil and Southeast Asia. Uh, and completely right. We are certainly being impacted by the uh, current viral situation, but as I'm sure we'll get into, we've learned a lot about ourselves. We've learned a lot about uh, what good looks like as you manage through something like this. And above all, we are super proud. Uh, and I'll actually uh, politely correct what you said. Not only have we been able to keep all of our full-time employees We've also kept all of our hourly employees, which in this environment, as uh, dining rooms are starting to reopen, has proven to be absolutely critical. Uh, it's it's going to be, I think, a source of advantage for us, and a, more importantly, a source of advantage for our employees and our customers. Yeah, how, that's, how that's incredible, and you know, you guys must be uh, congratulated for doing that. So we'd love to sort of dig in and find out a little bit more about how you've actually done that. But before, maybe before we do that, just from a perspective of, 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 of being an executive and the emotions that go through this, you know, chief customer officer, COVID-19 comes out of nowhere, physical lockdown, you have to shut all the promises. What goes through your mind? Uh, well, the first step is just to accept it. Uh, I think we in the restaurant industry, if you go back to early March, we're thinking, well, here's a, the next big story. We've heard a lot of illnesses before. Uh, this one started to feel a little bit different. And I can still remember, uh, it was March the 14th. It was a Saturday morning and we got our sales report from the day before. And it was the first time we said, okay, you know, this is real. And for, I can't remember how many days in a row, something like 30, 35 days in a row, our executive team met on a daily basis for at least two hours a day. Uh, and I remember those early days, you had to quickly, well, first of all, you had to quickly pivot your business. Everyone had to um, with varying levels of success, but really what you had to do was identify what are the priorities going to be. And for us, we quickly got to, the priorities are our people and our food. And so if we can continue to keep our people as many as possible, uh, working and engaged, um, and if we can keep food flowing through our restaurants and going through our already established off-premises channels, then we know how to prioritize everything else. So the fact that in the first 24, 48 hours, we said, our people are going to be important in this, we're going to do right by them, that guided a lot of the other moves that we made. Uh, and again, like I said, that 
this is where we came out on the positive end where knock on wood uh, on May the 5th, 2020, we hope we've seen the worst of this as dining rooms reopen, but we'll see. So lesson one was uh, be nimble, work together, tear down any old uh, organizational or cultural walls that existed, hold hands, we're in this together and rally around the priorities that matter. And you, you, you made uh, a, a point in the in the press that we saw around it that you know you you, that you tripled your off premise uh, sales when uh, the story came out, um, and you just mentioned then that you were already in the place you know you'd already established um, your kind of online uh, uh, business, got that going, but you know in the space of uh, overnight, really, you you go you have to do this sort of digital acceleration and move everything to to that. Uh, those channels. So tell us a little bit about how you've been able to uh, to really kind of lift the performance of uh, of your, your off-premise sale, off sales so quickly. Yeah, we were doing off-premises before it was cool. Uh, back in the, I think the early 90s, we were doing the takeaway business and building separate doors and separate parking spaces and a very analog on the phone experience uh, up, up till about Three or four years ago, uh, we did a, a big piece of strategy work that said, okay, uh, delivery is happening. Uh, where should we fit into that world? Should we be participating with third parties or should we be doing it ourselves? And at the time we said, this is a thing that we want to own. So we built a capability, a culture, physical plant, uh, back, you know, back of house processes that allowed us to do delivery from the kitchen to the front doorstep through our own drivers. Uh, late in 2019, we said, okay, there's a whole separate set of customers coming through third parties, DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera. So let's tap into that. So going into this, we had a really strong multi-channel approach um, that was working well and growing quickly and was becoming a meaningful part of our business. So when this happened, we're able to say, all right, now all the resources go to this. Uh, and it really, you know, as you quoted, the, uh, the performance tripled and we started seeing volumes through our own online portal that we never thought we would. Uh, we've seen you know, still phone volumes go crazy. Uh, but again, when you put the priority around people and food and there's only a, a few channels available, everything comes really clear. Uh, but we're proud that we invested ahead of time and, you know, as I've said to a lot of people, there's really not much that's happened during this virus that was a new trend. There may be, I mean, I think of specific examples, we weren't wearing masks on a regular basis before, but we were doing things online, we were getting things ordered, we were more worried about where our food was coming from, we're worried about personal hygiene, and I just think all this did was push adoption five years ahead. And so the level of off-premises uh, business that we're doing, we don't see it all falling off immediately. We actually think a lot of that's going to stay because if I were to ask the two of you, what's something that once you learned how to do it on your phone and once you learned you didn't have to leave your house to get that thing, when did you ever go back the other way? Uh, you didn't. And the reason you would in this case, in the restaurant case, is to go back into a dining room to experience good times with your friends and family. Uh, and that may be on hold for a little while. Um, but until then, we're gonna do everything we can to, to enable the, you know, whether it's the phone like this, the phone like this, we're gonna get food to you one way or the other. Well, I mean, there are some some trends that you're able to uh, to get rid of because I've become addicted to TikTok. <laughs> TikTok videos. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't really gotten into the TikTok thing for the benefit of the whole world. I haven't gotten into the TikTok thing. Nobody wants to see any viral dances coming from me. So, well, <laughs> I mean, I do hope that in the future people continue to wash their hands and to continue respecting personal space. I think that's a good thing, generally. For yeah, sure, I agree. Agree with that. Come so to you, um, you know, I wanted to ask you. We we talked uh, last week before we we were prepping for this. Your analytics from this new normal uh, are really telling you some interesting things. You talked about identifying new customers. You also talked about 
um, your messaging, which you guys are great at, right? We're, we're great partners together, but we really love what you're doing at Bloomin' Brands. You're very forward thinking. You want to follow up. You want to understand how people's experiences are happening in your restaurant. And you've been able to shorten the cadence on surveying and feedback loops to really get you know quick info to quick action. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what, what you're finding from the analytics and how that messaging cadence is changing in these times? Yeah, do you remember in the movie Independence Day when they're down in the Area 51 bunker and they meet the scientists with the long hair and he's talking about how in the last few days all of the machines have started buzzing and whirring that they captured in the 50s. And he says, hey, it's all really exciting. And then Bill Pullman comes back and says, exciting, there's people you know, in trouble. Well, that's kind of what's happened with us. Every day we have to tell ourselves, yes, this is really exciting, cool stuff that we're seeing. We're seeing incredible amounts of new customers, uh, crazy adoption of our online ordering, everything that I've mentioned but at the expense of a large virus that's going on around the world. So you don't want to see it that way, uh, but you do like to see these cool things. And what was, I think, one of the more interesting takeaways from the last few weeks is, you know, every day we're looking at these people and who are they and attaching them to uh, data from our Dine Rewards program. And when you see a big flock of customers coming in online, historically you would say, well, these are going to be the younger uh, you know, more tech savvy, uh, more ahead of the curve type of people. But really what we're seeing is more 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds uh, that are for the first time really adopting online ordering and adopting delivery. And you know, our core customer for a long time has been uh, part of an older generation. So we're seeing them now learn how to do it. And as I, uh, I asked my boss the other day if I had permission to say that old dogs are learning new tricks. And you know, he, he blessed that because he's in the age group of the old dogs that are learning new tricks. Uh, but you know, I think to your point on the messaging to them, we used to have a cadence where uh, through your messaging platform that's been a you know, really, really great tool for us, they would order, get their delivery, or come pick it up. The next day they would get a survey. And then seven days later, they would be invited with a special offer to come back again, order delivery, order takeout, you name it. Well, in March, April, May of 2020, seven days is about three years. So uh, with your help and with uh, the Cheetah platform, we've been able to totally change this cadence and think of it more of a bringing them along the journey to get them back reordering again. And uh, you know, what we really want is to maintain this group of people that we have, uh, that we know their behaviors are going to stick after this. Uh, plus, we want to turn them into multi-channel customers. So we've known for a long time that customers that use us both off-premises and in the dining room, those are our most valuable customers uh, that we're in their consideration set more frequently. We want to make more of those, and we're really excited that we can be there for them regardless of how they want to order from us, regardless of whether they want to, where they want to enjoy a blooming onion or bang, bang shrimp, you name it. Uh, we can be there for them no matter what. Oh man, you're getting me. I'm hungry now, man. That <laughs> blooming onion, a blooming yeah, onion and a tall beer at an Outback steakhouse. We're, we're coming up on uh, on happy hour time and yeah. you know. So it's a fascinating um, insight though to Kind of some of the challenges that that you or opportunities that you will have, you know, post lockdown because this influx of this whole new audience to your online, your off-premise sales um, that are a different demographic than perhaps you were experiencing before. Um, you know that that as an opportunity is fantastic if you can not only just retain them into those online channels but bring them in uh, to uh, the physical um, uh, restaurants as as, as well. Um, how do you think the restaurant industry as a whole is going to adapt to this new opportunity of, of maybe commingling these different business models of the physical and the online um, and then keeping these new audiences moving forward? Well, I'm obviously uh, a fan of and am biased toward Bloomin' Brands, but I'm actually really just proud of the industry overall, uh, particularly casual dining, which has been uh, considered the laggard category. Um, for several years now uh, within the industry. 
and to see how restaurants, big and small, have adapted to this, uh, it's been really great to see. And I, I am happy to say that we have competitors that have caught up with us, um, you know, or, or at least tried to get some of the the position back that we invested in ahead. Uh, I just think that from now on, every restaurant company is going to have to think about multi-channel uh, delivery, multi-channel ordering, messaging with their customers the way that uh, that we have been with your team. Uh, the world is going to change quickly again. You just think about how much change happened all at once. Well, it means it, it could very well happen again. We could see it again in the fall. I hope not. Uh, but I think restaurants have to be ready to flip these switches and be ready to say, okay, this circuit is broken. We now have to go to this one and we can keep operating and keep the, the cash coming in. Um, I just think as long as we're honest with ourselves that uh, we're never gonna snap back to exactly the way things were before, uh, then I think we can be prepared for this. I, I, I don't like comparing anything to 9-11, but if you compare this to 9-11, uh, back then it was, mostly travel and airlines that were getting hit so hard. And for a while you thought, well, no one's ever gonna feel totally safe on a plane again. And no one's ever gonna travel for business the way we used to because we're in this you know, big travel driven recession. It took a couple of years, but everything came back, but it wasn't exactly the same. You come back and you have new security measures in airports. You have the rise of things like clear and things like TSA PreCheck that I think are great benefits to the world. And I think it's great to feel safe being on a plane, but uh, you know, we were, we were fine after a few years. So it could be that in the future, there's more of a nod to uh, spacing in the dining room. Hopefully, you know, I, I think we're well past the what if there's new cleanliness standards. I think those should be absolutely put into place. Uh, will employees wear masks all the time? I don't know. The point is, we don't get to decide that as restaurant companies. Uh, healthcare professionals and, uh, and our customers, our guests, they're gonna decide that for us. They're gonna tell us what makes them feel comfortable and doctors who know what they're talking about are gonna tell us what to do to do our part to stop spreads of this or any other virus. So again, restaurant companies have to be ready for a future that's not exactly the same as it was before. But I think also to be ready for a time when we can celebrate that we have full dining rooms and we're, the restaurants are noisy and there's groups of people celebrating together because we as humans are never going to sit, you know, we're not going to sit in our houses forever. Yeah. How, how important is, you know, in, there, we assume we're going to be in a, some period of potentially uh, a potential disruption with a changing environment, um, you know, as uh, conditions are eased as potentially, you know, potentially we could see certain places more lockdowns, you know, as they control the outbreak until we have a vaccine. And then you've got this oscillating, you know, group of customers between you, the online audience and the new ones there and your traditional, you know, come into the restaurant, sit down, which, you know, hopefully very soon that's going to start opening up. But there's going to be, one would assume, a period of, of uncertainty in different markets. How, how important do you feel? Um, data is going to be to the restaurant industry and, and actually being able to really get a grip and a view on what is happening across these different channels. I mean, you can't possibly overstate how important it is, but it's different kinds of data than you ever expected would be this important. So the way that we've always viewed it and have let it fuel our work with your teams and, and fuel the way that we message Let's take into account who the person is. Let's take into account what they do, whether they use delivery, whether they use our online ordering, dining in. Do they like to drink? Are they vegetarians? Do they like one brand or all of our brands? Take all of that. Then layer on uh, weather, sports, uh, holidays, anything back to school, anything that we know about the rest of the world. Well, now there's this other one. And there's this healthcare data and viral data that we're monitoring every day, state by state, and understanding what the regulations are, what we can do. Uh, it's massively important for, to have all this information at hand. But even more than that, uh, I heard someone today tell me that a lot of this is kind of like you know being a cyborg. You've got part machine, part human, 
you have to have the humans that are running the business connected in a way that you can make quick decisions. You can't just sit back, put a bunch of data in an algorithm and say, all right, uh, all of the regional VPs of ops now know exactly what to do. That is not the case. Uh, so the data is critical, but the people and the processes in the organization to bring it to life and to bring it down to our employees in the restaurants and the way that they're interacting with our customers, you got to have all that. But you know what's what's great is that the more people we get into our online ordering, uh, the more people we get into our off premises, the more we learn. The trick is how to connect them through every channel and every behavior that they do uh, in a non creepy way. And the way to do that is through our Dine Rewards program, which you know we're very clearly exchanging information for rewards, and it's great for our customers and it's great for us. It's it's quite interesting. We did uh, we did some e consultancy. We commissioned some research with uh, e consultancy in February and March, um, and uh, it was six markets around the world. And actually, what we saw coming back from that research was that um, there was this difference between, on the one hand, you had about roughly about forty percent of consumers in various different markets that were turned off um, heavily personalized ads. Uh, to them that you know had been driven from cookie data or third party data where they they didn't understand why why the brand knew this about them and it actually turned them off and yet mm -hmm. on the other hand you had uh consumers saying that they'll willingly share data direct to a brand in return for value and actually loyalty is uh, uh apparently going to be significantly on the rise because nine times as many consumers in the US plan to participate in more loyalty program than those that actually were going to reduce their involvement in loyalty programs. So perhaps we're entering into a sort of, you know, recessionary period in this post COVID-19 where people are going to be looking for, for value and, and, and loyalty programs could be that construct uh, for, for, for brands and consumers to, to, to realize that value. Yeah. And, and we're seeing, uh, Great enrollment in our program, uh, outperforming a previous period. So I think what you're saying is, is exactly right. And I think a, any good loyalty program has to have a combination of value that I deliver to you, a differentiated experience, and a set of promotions and, and ways to communicate with you that are relevant. Uh, I think what you're seeing now is that restaurant companies the value part is pretty clear. Most people are trading some discount for, for food, whatever. Uh, but the experiential part, uh, much of what gets unlocked there is online ordering and the process you have through all the digital channels. And if I order something from outback.com and it's very easy for me to save that information and to have an easier ordering experience the next time because I'm a Dine Rewards member, then there you go. That's naturally going to increase the enrollment. Um, but that's an ever-changing program for us and uh, exciting things to come on that one. But uh, I think you're right. I mean, value is going to be important and ease of using digital channels is going to be important for a long time. Yeah, hundred percent. We we definitely agree. And look, this uh, this is great. It's kind of a an innovation marriage, right? You guys were early adopters to your own delivery network as needed. Um, you know, you, you've, you were ahead of the game come COVID, not laying anyone off and keeping your hourly employees is just amazing. We were just named a leader in the Forrester Wave for email, which you guys are a huge uh, user of, and we appreciate that. Uh, we've already had the email wave leader in, in loyalty. We're in the CDP Institute. So um, we love that you innovate, and I think that's the common bond here between us. You're innovating in real time. You're taking quick, uh, quick information, quick action. You know we're innovating on our solutions and products that power those solutions. Um, this is this is inspiring stuff for me. I'm excited about this. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, I I am relatively new to Bloomin, and I came from a client services background. Uh, and your your team is one of the first that I got to know, and the capabilities that I saw, and it's been a great partnership. Um, yeah, I think there's more, there's more to come. Uh, but it's no surprise to me that you're getting accolades from, uh, from the industry. And we're excited about everything that we know we can do with all of this new data that we have coming in and new ways that we know that 
our customers want to be communicated, you know, the way they would like to be communicated with. And you know, back to the point on uh, Richard, you're talking about this uh, being turned off by you know, too much detail, TMI, right? You do not want to put TMI in any of these messages. We don't want to say, hey, we knew you were at Outback on Tuesday on Henderson and you ordered a blooming onion. How was that? Like, that's just, that's just showboating. What you'd rather do is find the relevant message once you've identified a pattern of a customer that says, you know what? Once a month, they seem to go out to dinner on you know, mid, midweek with a group of people, don't know who they are, but let's get ahead of that decision and you know, convince them that uh, dinner at Carabas would be fantastic. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's just sort of I think it's it is why I, you know talk to folks about sort of these uh, privacy things. You know, in many ways, it's it's just manners now being related to the digital space. So you know, yeah. uh, if, if you've got new neighbours coming into your uh, your road, you don't put a tracking bug under the car and spy cameras through the window to get to know them. You you go around with a bottle of wine and ask them. And uh, you know, we're just seeing some of that. Uh, play out in the uh, in the in the digital realm now, um, and I think that the interesting about loyalty is loyalty programs. Exactly to your point about having that, it's not just points for purchases. It's you know having the the engagement, the the emotional loyalty, the challenges, the you know the, the more the experiences, the fun stuff. That is a perfect ground for you to actually get the consumer to tell you about themselves and their desires and their interests, which means personalization off the back of it. Is absolutely not um, creepy. You know, they're expecting yeah. you to get information from the POS systems, and and if you also ask them, they're going to tell you. We saw that come clean, uh, loud and clear through the research that we did. That, that consumers will share information if asked. Well, it's all. I mean, to that same point, this idea of self-selection and putting myself into a segment also translates to the dining rooms right now. Uh, when you see restaurants that have opened it's inspiring to see that people are coming back and they're being safe and our employees are being are safely interacting with them but you're also seeing a group of people that are saying you know what i trust that this is going to be a safe place to go and you don't have to overdo it uh, and and i respect and understand there's people who we may, we may never see in our dining room again and i i get it there's you know this is a new world we live in but there are lots of different customer segments out there and there's different ways to communicate with them, to interact with them. Um, and the big challenge is, you know, how do you manage the data and manage the communications and manage the messaging? That's why you need someone like a cheetah to, to help you with that. And, and that's it, right? It's a singular view of the customer life cycle, uh, being able to look at all these different data sets, be able to, to really understand the personalized needs um, and one-to-one -one marketing and one-to-one -one offers, you know, loyalty, that, that's loyalty one-on-one. So Richard, yeah. Michael is a very, um, he's a very busy man with a big schedule, but I, I know you probably have one more question for him before we end today. Do you have anything? Well, my, my um, uh, simple question is actually of all of the, and this is a tough one. <laughs> we might have to edit this out, but of all of the oh brands yeah. that you have, what's your favorite meal? In which brand? That is uh, that is very difficult. I think. Uh, all right, this is cheating, but it's gonna it's gonna happen. I think I start with a blooming onion. There's no no question about that. Two two uh, blooming onions. Well, probably two. Yeah. And then I'm uh, I'm probably gonna get uh, some bang bang shrimp from Bonefish just because I didn't have quite enough appetizer. And then I'm gonna get um, the chicken brian from Carabas, uh, just unreal. With a side of lobster mac from Fleming's, and then uh, cap it off with one of each Fleming's dessert. Uh, I think that's, that's it. That's, that is the perfect meal. Uh, we actually asked this question to each other on draft night, whenever that was a couple, couple weeks ago. If you were to do a draft of all the items, what would be the number one pick? You know, who, who are your first round picks among the brands? 
And that was that was actually my answer, uh, pretty much in order. Bloomin' Onions, the number one draft pick. I, I got to tell you, I tried to recreate it at home a few times over the last few years. Impossible. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Keep sending it. Keep delivering it. I'll keep ordering it. That and a Foster's. I'm down with yeah, Foster's. Yeah, there you go. Well, but before before you uh, let me go, I will uh, for anyone that's listening, uh, just appreciate all the support that we've seen from customers uh, from other industries for the whole restaurant industry. Uh, the the way that the restaurant industry has banded together has been really cool. Uh, I think we all have sympathy for each other's uh, situations that they're in. Customers have been tipping more than ever before. Uh, they've been showing gratitude through uh, our surveys and through the comments and through the face-to-face -face interactions that they're giving to our people. Uh, nothing matters more to us than our employees and our customers and, and giving them something that's going to make their lives feel a little more normal. And you know, there is something emotional about having that blooming onion or whatever the thing is that you associate with good times and less craziness. Uh, and we're just Happy to be able to do that, and no matter what brand, no matter what food, you know, we're, the restaurant industry is still here, and we're glad to be, you know, part of the American fabric right now. Well, thank you, thank you for you know doing what you guys have done, taking the stance you've you've heard, looking after your people. Um, it's great to to see, and you know, we're we're honoured to be uh, a small part of uh, of your story. So, look forward to working with you uh, in the future, hopefully to power blooming brands and the whole of the restaurant industry through a great recovery. So thank you, Michael. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Great, guys. Thanks again.